Good morning. I'm Dr. Andrew LaBarber, Chief Scientific Officer of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the third presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. These twice monthly webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Learning Guide in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Today's presentation will be given by Dr. Leslie Myatt, formerly of the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, and now Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Myatt is an internationally recognized expert in the field of placental biology. The title of his talk today is Endocrinology of the Maternal Fetal Placental Unit. I will now turn the microphone over to Mr. Jeff Hayes, our education specialist, who will review the details of today's presentation and introduce Dr. Myatt. Jeff? Thank you, Dr. LaBarbera. Hello to everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, the ASRM Education Specialist and Moderator for this webinar. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, first, to make sure we can cover all the content in the allotted time, everyone's line except the speakers will be muted. We will devote about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to questions. Please feel free to type a question in the chat window at any time. I will then read as many selected questions as possible to the presenter during the allotted questions and answer time. If for some reason you need to step away from the presentation, please sign out and then sign back in upon your return. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your CME credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Our speaker today is Dr. Leslie Myatt. We're very excited for his talk today, so without uh, any further delays, I'll go ahead and turn things over now to our presenter, Dr. Leslie Myatt. Dr. Myatt. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Les Myatt. As uh, Dr. LaBarbera said, I've just very recently, two weeks ago, moved to Oregon Health and Science University. So today we're going to talk about endocrinology of the maternal fetal placental unit. And I first have to state I have nothing to disclose in this presentation. So our learning objectives is that at the end of the presentation, you should be able to define the central role of the placenta in regulating maternal and fetal physiology in pregnancy, demonstrate placental structure and cell lineages, outline placental production of placental hormones, including HCG, steroids, and angiogenic factors, define the interaction of the maternal and fetal compartments in progesterone and estrogen synthesis, Describe the role of 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 in limiting fetal exposure to glucocorticoids and describe interactions of the maternal placental fetal hormonal mechanisms that regulate parturition. So as I'm sure you're aware, most if not all of the physiologic changes are regulated by the pregnancy hormones, including the regulation of trophoblast invasion and the vast increase in uterine blood flow that occurs, the cardiovascular, pulmonary and renal adaptations, the immune response to pregnancy, particularly the control of maternal metabolism to supply substrates to the fetus, and finally fetal growth and development. And at the end of pregnancy, hormonal regulated mechanisms are involved in the change from uterine quiescence to contractility and finally to uterine involution, in cervical competence throughout pregnancy and then ripening the dilation at term and the preparation for lactation. So the operative mechanisms include the ones we'd obviously think about being endocrine, autocrine, and intracrine, involving the, the steroids, estrogen, progestins, glucocorticoids, and mineralocorticoids, but also importantly peptide hormones, including chorionic gonadotrophin, prolactin, and lactogens, and the more recently described angiogenic factors, cytokines, and growth factors. It's important also to realize that lipids, including fatty acids such as sphingolipids and prostaglandins, are operate as regulators of uh, physiologic mechanisms during pregnancy. And finally, if we have a little bit of time, I'm going to talk about some emerging work on the role of microRNAs and other short non-coding RNAs as messengers between placental and maternal compartments, and a little bit, hopefully, about cell-free fetal DNA. So I refer to the placenta as the director of pregnancy. Obviously, the main function of the placenta is to transport oxygen from mother to fetus and remove carbon dioxide. 
and it does this by causing trophoblast invasion of the decidua, which adapts the utroplacental arteries to increase utroplacental blood flow, and on the fetal side, um, angiogenic factors released by the placenta regulate development of the fetal placental vasculature, the end result being an increase in blood flows on both sides of the placenta, which limits the transfer of flow-limited substrates such as, such as oxygen. In addition, the placenta is a variable factory for production of peptide and steroid hormones. These are secreted both towards fetal and maternal circulations. In the maternal circulation, the peptide and steroid hormones control maternal metabolism, the end result being an increase in the level of maternal substrates that are available for transport across to the fetus. But in addition, peptide and steroid hormones released by the placenta can also affect fetal growth and development. The maternal substrates are transported across the placenta by a variety of specific nutrient transporters on the trophoblast membrane, and on the way, some are metabolized, obviously, to different metabolites, but which ultimately affect fetal growth and development. So it's obvious that any disruption in placental function is going to disrupt fetal growth and development and lead to what now is called fetal programming, a uh, determinant of disease in adult life, but also is going to affect maternal metabolism. So just to summarize the function, it's primarily the immune barrier between mother and fetus, regulates exchange of gases, transport of nutrients, removal of fetal waste. It's also responsible for transfer of antibodies from mother to fetus and secretion of a wide variety of hormones, including the steroid hormones, peptide hormones, and angiogenic factors, which regulate maternal metabolism, fetal growth and differentiation, and placental blood flows. It's important to realize that the mother, the fetus, and placenta function as a triad in concert with each other. The mother generates the intrauterine environment in which the placenta and fetus exist. We all now, now talk a lot about adverse intrauterine environments such as generated by obesity, gestational diabetes, medical conditions such as preeclampsia, and these obviously affect placental function and ultimately fetal growth and development. The placenta also serves to transduce the external environment in which the mother exists. Uh, being exposed, for example, to endocrine disruptors, uh, external stress, et cetera, and that is then transduced through the placenta again to affect the fetus. But the three function together uh, are not in isolation. The placenta undergoes a tremendous amount of growth and development throughout gestation. So as you can see here, the differences between six weeks and term, we see a vast increase in placental efficiency. Such a term, we get seven grams of fetus supported by one gram of placenta, uh, as opposed to 0 0.018 at six weeks. This is accomplished by a vast increase in uh, vascularity of the placenta. Fully one quarter of the placenta at term is composed of the vasculature. The trophoblast surface area increases exponentially throughout gestation, such as at term there is 12.5 square meters of villous trophoblast surface area. And in uh, simple terms, this corresponds to the area of a parking spot. So if you can imagine that there's one giant syncytium that's the size of a parking spot, that is the trophoblast surface area or placental surface area at term. To also make transport more efficient, the mean trophoblast thickness and maternal-fetal diffusion distance decrease steadily throughout gestation, uh, such that at term it's about four microns to obviously facilitate transport of substrates. So shown here is a cross-section, a cartoon of the full-term placenta in situ. We have two umbilical arteries and one vein, which then uh, diverge into the coronic plate vessels. The coronic plate vessels then dive through the coronic plate surface and form the villus trees, as you can see there. At the tips of the villus trees are the anchoring villi, from which cytotrophoblasts erupt to anchor the placenta into the decidua and the uterus. The uterine blood flow enters the intervillous space by the spiral arteries and exits by the endometrial veins, and the intervillous space, shown in light blue, bathes the villous tissue in maternal blood. If we look at a cross-section across uh, the, the uh, villi, this is what we see. In the first trimester, you'll see two layers of trophoblast. The inner one is called the cytotrophoblast, or the Langhans layer, 
and this is the progenitor cell for the syncytia trophoblast, ST on the outside, which is in contact with maternal blood. So throughout gestation, cytotrophoblast cells fuse into the syncytia trophoblast and continuously regenerate the syncytia trophoblast. Once they fuse into the syncytia trophoblast, the cells enter the apoptotic cascade and eventually are shed into the maternal blood. If we look at the cross-section in the third trimester, it's obvious that there's a much greater vascularity of the villi, as shown by the presence of the red blood cells there in the uh, fetal placental vasculature. You can see that the syncytia trophoblast layer, ST, is much thinner, and there are very few cytotrophoblast cells underlying the syncytia trophoblast. Some people believe this is because they're becoming exhausted as they've all fused <clears throat> into the syncytium. Other people believe it's just that there's as many there, but they're harder to find as they're compacted in. But you can also see the presence of syncytial knots in the third trimester villi. These are the uh, final step in the apoptotic cascade, and these syncytial knots are then shed into the maternal blood in the interval of space, and these form the basis of cellular uh, cell, cellular fragments, which are found in the maternal circulation, which can persist for many, many years after the end of pregnancy, and they're also the source of the fetal DNA in maternal blood. So when we talk about fetal DNA in maternal blood or cell-free fetal DNA, we're probably talking about placental DNA in maternal blood. This is a cross-section of the full-term placenta, and you can see here the interval of space on the left the syncytia trophoblast layer, and uh, one shown here, one progenitor cytotrophoblast cell, which will eventually fuse into the syncytium, and then the underlying fetal capillary, which is in close proximity to the basement membrane of the syncytia trophoblast layer, and the diffusion distance between maternal blood and fetal blood at term is around four microns to facilitate oxygen diffusion and uptake of substrates. We can demonstrate markers of trophoblast differentiation both in vitro and in vivo. So as cytotrophoblasts fuse and form a syncytium, we see increased gene expression for coronet gadotropin, placental lactogens, pregnancy-specific glycoproteins, CRH and aromatase, and many other uh, syncytia trophoblast markers. So these are used both in vivo and in vitro as markers of trophoblast differentiation as part of the syncytialization process. We also need to consider another trophoblast population. So the anchoring, at the tips of the anchoring villi, we see cytotrophoblast cell columns that form, and these cytotrophoblasts then proliferate and erupt into the decidua, and they form what is called the interstitial cytotrophoblast. In the first trimester, you see these very narrow spiral arteries, which have very limited blood flow into the intervillous space. But as we move further into gestation, the interstitial cytotrophoblast cells penetrate deeper from the decidua into the myometrium, and they then form giant cells. And we also start to see dilation of the spiral arteries, so we see a big increase in flow or low resistance flow into the intervillous space to accommodate the growing placenta and fetus. And we also see trophoblast cells, so-called endovascular trophoblast cells, which line the inner surface of the spiral arteries. The jury is still out as to whether these endovascular trophoblast cells arise by retrograde movement down inside the spiral arteries or whether they arise by crossing the spiral artery vessel wall and replacing the endothelial cells in these spiral arteries. Typically, people have thought as only the syncytial trophoblast has been responsible for hormone production throughout gestation, producing the steroid and peptide hormones. But recent work in mouse models has suggested that various extravillous trophoblast populations, uh, the equivalent, uh, the spongier trophoblast in the mouse being the equivalent of giant cells in the human, also have endocrine functions and may regulate maternal metabolism. So this is a developing area that we may see more um, findings in subsequently that the extravillous trophoblast also has endocrine roles in pregnancy. But if we look at the trophoblast cell lineages, obviously from the oocyte and the blastocyst, the inner cell mass forms the fetus. The outer trophoblast layer is thought to be 
a, a placental stem cell that differentiates down two different pathways, one to form the villous cytotrophoblast, which fuses and then forms the syncytiotrophoblast. The other pathway, it forms the extravillous cytotrophoblast cells, which become invasive EVTs and can then diverge down to either interstitial EVTs in the decidua and myometrium or into endovascular extravillous trophoblast cells which line the spiral arteries either within the wall or within the artery as I said. So there's a great deal of interest now in trying to isolate pluripotent placental stem cells which ultimately could be used uh, for regeneration of the placenta. So if we look at placental development, the placenta is a constant state of growth and differentiation throughout the 40 weeks of gestation and this just shows a timeline illustrating uh, what's happening at different times during gestation. So trophoblast invasion of the uh, decidua and myometrium is thought to occur between 8 and 16 weeks gestation. The establishment of blood flow to the intervillous space occurs between about 11 and 12 weeks of gestation. If we look at development of the uh, fetal placental vasculature, we primarily see branching angiogenesis up to about 24 weeks of gestation and that's replaced then by non-branching angiogenesis as we form more and more capillary loops within the villi to increase the exchange surface area of the, of the um, villus trophoblast. If we look at trophoblast differentiation and syncytium formation, that mainly occurs from about 16 weeks gestation onwards and we go into exponential trophoblast differentiation, syncytium formation and fetal growth in the third trimester of pregnancy. But it's obvious that if we disrupt this normal process of placental development at any stage throughout gestation, we're obviously going to uh, gravely affect placental growth and development and hence fetal growth and development. And also if we apply the same insult, say hyperglycemia at different points in gestation, we may see different effects depending on what is happening to trophoblast and fetal development at that time. The trophoblast also has several distinct functions. It functions both as an epithelial cell in expressing nutrient transporters such as glucose, amino acid and lipid transporters and expression of receptors, for example, growth factors, insulin. But it also has a tremendous endocrine function, as we're all aware, in production of steroid hormones, peptide hormones and prostaglandins. But the trophoblast also assumes endothelial functions during pregnancy. It can produce nitric oxide, prostaglandins, the annexins, which have anti-aggregatory properties and prevent platelets and white blood cells sticking to the trophoblast cell surface. And it also secretes pro and anti-angiogenic factors, as we're going to discuss a little bit later. So it's, this cell has got a wide range of functions and it's, it's uh, not confined to one specific role during pregnancy. It also produces a huge range of hormones and growth factors. So we're obviously all familiar with production of estrogens from progesterone by the human placenta, but it also produces a wide range of peptide hormones, including growth hormones, the placental lactogens, the insulin-like growth factors, which can affect um, fetal growth. It produces pro and anti-angiogenic factors, such as PLGF, soluble fluid, and endoglin. It has a complete uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It makes ACTH, CRH, and uh, is involved in cortisol metabolism, and produces a whole range of other peptides, some of which are, whose roles are now starting to be uh, elucidated. In particular, recently, there's been the description of serotonin production by the human placenta, and placental serotonin appears to play a role in the regulation of fetal brain development throughout gestation. So uh, new peptides being, uh, and transmitters being discovered the whole time and new roles elucidated for what the placenta actually does. If one is going to study human placental function, and if you indeed are actually going to study placental function, there are certain things you really need to take into account now as, as potential confounders. So in particular, recently there's been the discovery that dependent upon fetal sex, a placental gene expression is different. There are large differences in placental gene expression depending on whether you're the placenta of a male or a female fetus. In particular, in the female placenta, we see a large increase in expression of immune-related genes. Um, this may relate 
to uh, differences in development we see obviously between a male and a female fetus in utero. The other thing that's apparent is there are large differences in placental function dependent on ethnicity. So one needs to take uh, patient ethnicity into account. And the other thing we're now increasingly aware of is the effect of environmental influences on placental function. So in particular, obesity, nutrient composition, the medical conditions present such as gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, the level of oxygenation, oxidative distress, whether the mother smokes or not, her immune status, whether there's an infection present or not, the presence of endocrine disrupting chemicals such as bisphenols or xenobiotics, whether the mother is exposed and the fetus are exposed to stress, and whether that pregnancy was a result of assisted reproductive technologies. All these things need to be taken into account now when studying placental function, and hence it's necessary that we uh, undertake very good clinical phenotyping of pregnancies in relation to pregnancy outcomes and placental function. So now I want to talk a little bit more detail about some specific um, hormones, in particular, first of all, placental HCG. As you're all aware, HCG secretion is detected within 24 hours of implantation and has a doubling time of two days. The function of HCG are uh, several. It prevents degradation of the corpus luteum and stimulates estrogen and progesterone production by the corpus luteum to support the uh, early pregnancy. It also suppresses maternal lymphocytes to prevent rejection of the fetal allograft. It apparently is involved in stimulation of trophoblast invasion, stimulation of fetal adrenal steroid synthesis, and fetal testicular testosterone synthesis. So you're probably familiar with this profile. Um, this is the profile of HCG uh, levels in the maternal circulation in early gestation, and you see that there's a peak of HCG at around 10 weeks gestation, after which it falls off, and it's shown also here as the production of progesterone, estrogens, prolactin by the placenta itself, which increased steadily throughout gestation. But this peak of HCG in early pregnancy is necessary to support the corpus luteum uh, and stimulate progesterone production until placental progesterone uh, produ production kicks in. So you see here, this is corpus luteum progesterone production in the first eight to 10 weeks of gestation. Then we see the luteal placental shift, as it's called, around eight weeks. And then we see this further rapid increase in placental progesterone, which supports the pregnancy. Also want to consider the placental synthesis of estrogen and progesterone. So the substrate for estrogen progesterone synthesis is cholesterol, which enters the placenta from the maternal circulation. Cholesterol is then converted to a pregnenolone. Pregnenolone can be converted to progesterone by the rate-limiting enzyme 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, but also pregnenolone can be transferred into the fetus. In the fetal adrenal gland, pregnenolone sulfate is converted to DHEA sulfate, dihydroepiandrostine, dione sulfate, and the liver, this is hydroxylated to 16-hydroxy DHEA sulfate. DHEA sulfate and 16-hydroxy DHEA sulfate, uh, under the action of sulfatase enzymes in the placenta, can be converted back to DHEA and 16-hydroxy DHEA, which are then converted to androstene dione and 16-hydroxy androstene dione, respectively. These, these can be acted upon by the aromatase enzyme to give estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Estriol being the major steroid, uh, major estrogen during pregnancy that is secreted back towards the maternal circulation. Note that in the human placenta, there is no pathway which will convert progesterone through to estrogens. But this pathway clearly shows the, the interaction of the maternal, placental, and fetal compartments in the coordinated production of progesterone and estrogens. So we definitely need the fetus in order to make estrogens. And 30 to 40 years ago, measurements of estriol in the maternal circulation were used as a measure of fetal well-being. Obviously, that test uh, has been superseded and is not used um, at the current time. Estrogen and progesterone have vital roles 
in pregnancy, in the decidua, progesterone is necessary for maintenance of the decidua prior to pregnancy. At the myometrial level, in broad terms, progesterone, progestational hormone, is associated with uterine quiescence, and the switch to estrogen is associated with myometrial contractility at term, and we'll come back to that later. Estrogens also control blood flow in the utero-placental circulation, so the work from Rosenfeld and Ken Clark over the last 30 years has clearly shown that estrogen is a major driver to the increased blood flow into the uterus during pregnancy. In the cervix, progesterone obviously increases the viscosity of cervical fluid, estrogen decreases that, and progesterone estrogen also regulates cervical competence, uh, ripening and dilation. In the mammary gland, the progesterone controls growth of alveoli where estrogen controls growth of the ducts. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, human chorionic somatomammotropin, HCS, also called human placental lactogen. Uh, HPL is synthesized by the syncytia trophoblast in amount proportional to syncytia trophoblast mass. So you see exponential increases in HPL production throughout gestation as the mass of syncytia trophoblast increases. HPL production is detectable by five weeks gestation and as we approach term, the production is about one gram per day. And that is equivalent to about 10% of all the peptide hormones. So overall, we produce about 10 grams of placental peptide per day at term. Uh, in contrast, we produce about 500 milligrams of progesterone at term. So as you can see, the placenta is a veritable factory for both steroid and placental peptide production. Human placental lactogen is secreted to the maternal circulation and the fetal circulation, and it has actions similar to human growth hormone. It increases blood-free fatty acids, glucose, and insulin. It increases lipolysis and insulin resistance, by in, which impairs glucose uptake and gluconeogenesis, and the net result is to make glucose and amino acids available for the fetus. And interestingly, HPL, however, is not essential for successful pregnancy. There are women who carry a pregnancy to term in the absence of HPL production, which is somewhat of a conundrum. So what does placental lactogen do? At the fetal level, it will stimulate uh, production of insulin-like growth factors, stimulates amino acid uptake, uh, ornithine decarboxylase, activity for DNA synthesis and repair, and it's also involved in production of surfactant. But particularly in the mother, it's involved, again, in lactation, IGF production, adrenocortical steroid hormone production, calcium transport, but importantly causes peripheral insulin resistance and glucose intolerance, which increases the levels of glucose available for transport across the fetus. It also stimulates lipolysis and proteolysis to increase the availability of amino acids for transport across to the fetus. And in the fetus, this glucose obviously stimulates the pancreas to cause insulin secretion in the fetus, which stimulates fetal growth and also causes glycogenesis. I also want to touch on the placental angiogenic factors. The placenta secretes both pro-angiogenic factors, including uh, BGF, or vascular endothelial derived growth factor, the A, B, C, and D isoforms, and placenta growth factor, PLGF. It also secretes a range of anti-angiogenic growth factors, including S endoglin and S flit 1, which is the soluble VEGF receptor 1. You're probably all familiar now with the uh, huge explosion of interest in measuring biomarkers for prediction of preeclampsia throughout gestation, and this has concentrated on measurement of angiogenic factors throughout gestation. So this is data from the uh, NIH Maternal Fetal Medicine Network, where we're showing median, and the top left PLGF levels, soluble FLIT levels, and endoglin levels throughout gestation. So the blue line are women who remain normotensive, and you see that production of soluble FLIT increases exponentially in late gestation, as does soluble endoglin. And this is because they're produced by syncytia trophoblast, and as syncytia trophoblast mass increases throughout gestation, so does production of the anti-angiogenic factors. If we look at PLGF, this is pro-angiogenic. You'll see production peaks at around 32 weeks gestation and then falls. 
and this corresponds to the periods of branching angiogenesis and non-branching angiogenesis in the fetal placental circulation. What you'll also see in women with, who develop preeclampsia is this left shift in the curve, so the increase in soluble endoglin and soluble flit occur much earlier in the preeclamptic woman, and the, rise, uh, the fall in um, PLGF occurs earlier and it never rises as high. So these have been attempted to be used to predict preeclampsia. Unfortunately, we've not been able to show that they're sufficiently sensitive in early gestation to predict uh, who will develop preeclampsia. And what we've also learned in the addition to this angiogenic imbalance between the pro and angi anti-angiogenic factors occurring in preeclampsia, it also occurs in pregnancies compromised by intrauterine growth restriction, unexplained fetal deaths, spontaneous preterm births, stillbirths, and mirror syndrome. So it's now apparent that rather than being specific biomarkers for development of preeclampsia, maybe these angiogenic factors are markers of placental or trophoblast well-being or placental health. And so now there's a new appreciation that they might pick up uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes uh, of a wide range rather than just preeclampsia. Other markers that have been related to adverse outcomes include uh, pregnancy, uh, sorry, trophoblast-specific peptides and such as corticotrophin-releasing hormones, CRH particularly, uh, has been shown to be altered in pregnancies that end in preterm birth, uh, pregnancy-associated plasma protein A or PAP-A, inhibin A, and placental protein 13, which is involved in trophoblast uh, invasion. So the next question that people are posing now in looking at these trophoblast markers of placental health is what controls their expression and when is the dysfunction that we see in trophoblast uh, production initiated? Uh, which stage of gestation does this occur? I also want to touch on the role of glucocorticoids in fetal development. So glucocorticoids are the master regulators of fetal growth and differentiation. And they're involved in maturation of the liver, lungs, the gut, skeletal muscle, and adipose tissue for extrauterine life. As you're well aware, glucocorticoids are involved in the production of surfactant and lung maturation as we approach the end of gestation. Glucocorticoids are also well known for their anti-inflammatory roles, but as I'll explain in a little while, they seem to have a paradoxical role in prostaglandin synthesis, prostaglandins being pro-inflammatory. Overexposure of the fetus to glucocorticoids has been linked to intrauterine growth restriction, postnatal hypertension, development of subsequent cardiovascular disease and glucose intolerance, and increased activity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and effects on fetal brain development. So obviously overexposure and inappropriate exposure of the fetus in utero to glucocorticoids is a bad thing. And in normal pregnancy, fetal exposure is limited by uh, the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 in the placenta. So what does 11-beta HSD2? So 11-beta HSD2 um, is um, the product of a gene that produces two enzymes. 11-beta HSD2 converts active cortisol into inactive cortisone. This is an oxidation step that requires NAD as cofactor. But the same enzyme will function in the reverse uh, direction as 11 beta HSD1, which reduces cortisone back to the active cortisol, and that requires NADPH as the cofactor. But the levels and activity of 11 beta HSD2 in the human placenta effectively form a barrier against maternal cortisol reaching the fetus. So 11 beta HSD2 in syncytia trophoblast converts cortisol to cortisone, blocks exposure to maternal cortisol. The expression and activity of 11-beta-HSD2 increase with gestational age, but then start to decrease at term at 38 to 40 weeks, and so allowing exposure of the fetus to glucocorticoids, and those glucocorticoids then are involved in the maturation of the fetal systems in preparation for extrauterine life. We also know that 11-beta-HSD2 starts to increase in the placenta at the time of the so-called oxygen switch. So this is the time when blood flow is established into the 
intervillous space at about eight to ten weeks of gestation. Conversely, hypoxia has been found to decrease 11 beta HSD2. So, for example, a severely intrauterine growth restrictive pregnancy where there's relative hypoxia in the uterus, there would be alterations in 11 beta HSD2 and alterations in exposure of the fetus to um, cortisol. Mutations in 11 beta HSD2 have been shown to be associated with intrauterine growth restriction. And as I said, it's decreased with hypoxemia, and it's also been shown to be increased, uh, decreased in the placenta in preeclampsia, which is also associated with hypoxia. And we now know that nutritional restriction or environmental pollutants can cause decreased 11 beta HSD2. So obviously, factors that regulate 11 beta HSD2 of great interest in people who are interested in fetal growth development and maturation of fetal systems. So it's a key enzyme. So I next want to move on to um, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal placental axis uh, in the placenta. So this slide is a slide that's, that's a classic, and one could almost describe this as the Nobel Prize that was never uh, awarded. So this describes the fetal HPA placental axis at term in the sheep. And this arises from work uh, done mainly by uh, Mont Liggins, who recently passed away, who's a New Zealand obstetrician who really discovered most of what we know about uh, what causes parturition. So in the fetal sheep at term, we get a maturation of this pathway such that hypothalamus secretes CRH, hits the pituitary to stimulate ACTH, ACTH hits the fetal adrenal, stimulates cortisol production, cortisol then hits the placenta, and switches on three enzymes, 17 alpha hydroxylase, 17 20 lyase, and aromatase, the net result being a switch from progesterone to estrogen production in the placenta. The estrogen can then stimulate the formation of many of the contraction associated proteins associated with parturition and also stimulate prostaglandin production. And the net increase in estrogen and prostaglandin production stimulate labor in the sheep. So Liggins was able to show that. Um, in the second or early third trimester, if you infuse CRH, ACTH, or cortisol into a fetal sheep, it was able to cause labor and the fetus would deliver. But interestingly, um, what he found, a seminal finding, was that in addition to being born, these animals' lungs were also mature. Hence, the work of Liggins and others discovered that glucocorticoids cause fetal lung maturation. And of of course, we use glucocorticoids now widely in clinical practice in women in threatened preterm labor to cause lung maturation um, and a very seminal finding in perinatology. Hence, I say uh, this was the Nobel Prize that never was because, unfortunately, um, Liggins passed away before he ever got um, nominated for a Nobel Prize. So what do cortisol or synthetic glucocorticoids such as dexamethasone do? They stimulate these three enzymes, and under the net action of these three enzymes, progesterone in the sheep placenta is converted to estrone and estrogen. Unfortunately, this pathway is not operative in the human placenta because the human placenta does not possess 17 alpha hydroxylase. And as I've said before, there's no pathway in the human for progesterone to be converted to estrogens. If we look at peripheral plasma steroids in the sheep, this is what happens as a result of the action of glucocorticoids. As we approach delivery, maternal progesterone falls. The, the progestational hormone falls, the one that's associated with uterine quiescence. And we see an increase in estrogen production and prostaglandin synthesis, which stimulates uh, contractions. So that myometrium switches from a quiescent state to a contractile state, and we get delivery. What progesterone and estrogen do is they regulate the formation of the so-called contraction associated proteins, which include uh, connexin 43, gap junctions, oxytocin receptor, the prostaglandin receptors, and prostaglandin H synthase 2 or cyclooxygenase 2. So these are activated in preparation for parturition, and we then need a stimulus uh, to cause this, such as stretch, progesterone withdrawal, estrogens, or cytokines and growth factors. This, 
steroid hormones are also involved in regulation of prostaglandin synthesis and action. So shown here is the so-called prostaglandin cascade. So the substrate for the prostaglandins is arachidonic acid, which is liberated from membrane phospholipids by phospholipase enzymes. The arachidonic acid is converted by PGH synthase or cyclooxygenase to the intermediate PGH2. And specific prostaglandin synthase, as shown here, PGE synthase, converted to a specific prostaglandin, shown here, PGE2. If this was S synthase, we'd have PGF2-alpha. That prostaglandin can then act on a prostaglandin receptor, or it can be metabolized to an inactive metabolite by prostaglandin dehydrogenase. And you can see here the various points at which the steroid hormones act. So, for example, progesterone stimulates prostaglandin dehydrogenase activity in every tissue, including the placenta. And high levels of progesterone cause high levels of prostaglandin dehydrogenase, which inactivate any prostaglandin which is produced and into the inactive metabolite. Estradiol and progesterone regulate the expression of prostaglandin receptors on myometrium. I'll show that in a second. Estradiol is thought to stimulate expression of prostaglandin A synthase or cyclooxygenase. And I'm going to show you some data, some novel data, showing that glucocorticoids can regulate the phospholipase and PGH synthase as well. So obviously the prostaglandin synthesis and action cascade can also be regulated by the relative balance of estrogens and progesterone. So shown here are the prostaglandin receptors on myometrium, in particular the balance of the relaxatory EP2, EP4, IP receptors versus the contractile. EP1, EP3, and FP receptors on myometrium is important. And we and others have shown that estrogen progesterone balance regulates expression of these relaxatory and contractile receptors on myometrium at term and also in cervix. So in the sheep, what we can show is that we get maturation of the fetal HPA axis as we approach term, the ACTH hits the fetal adrenal, stimulates cortisol production. Cortisol stimulates the 17.5 hydroxylase to cause estrogen production, which upregulates these contraction-associated proteins. And cortisol is also being shown, and I'll show you a little bit of data, in that it stimulates PGHS2 to stimulate prostaglandin production. However, there is a conundrum in understanding the mechanism of human parturition that I'm sure you're all aware because in humans, there is no fall in peripheral plasma progesterone at term. However, the anti-progestin RU486 will induce labor at term. It's not so good at inducing labor in the second trimester, but will induce labor at term. So suggesting that uh, progesterone action is involved in parturition or withdrawal of progesterone action is involved in parturition. And there's also, uh, Obviously, the knowledge that when we give exogenous glucocorticoids to cause long maturation, they do not stimulate labor. So that suggests that the mechanism uh, that's operative in the sheep, where glucocorticoids stimulate labor, is not operative in the human placenta. This is the patterns of peripheral plasma steroids in the human throughout gestation. So you can see that progesterone rises throughout gestation. That there's no significant fall as we approach term. And interestingly, I also know that the patterns of um, estrogen production, particularly estriol, continues to increase throughout gestation. There, although there is no fall in peripheral plasma progesterone, the ratio of estrogen to progesterone increases constantly throughout gestation. So knowing that there's no um, fall in peripheral plasma progesterone at term, uh, for the last 30 to 40 years, people have asked, OK, is there some mechanism or for functional progesterone withdrawal that operates in the human in the absence of this fall in a peripheral plasma progesterone. So the work of Paul McDonald and others in Dallas uh, and then Peter Nathaniels and latterly Sam Messiano have investigated whether there are alterations in local progesterone synthesis or metabolism and that's not been found, whether progesterone binding for, by plasma proteins can give a, a relative fall in active progesterone, whether there are alterations in the circadian rhythm of estrogen and progesterone synthesis, uh, which have been found to correlate with the rhythm of uterine contractility, the switch from contractures to contractions. And finally, uh, a focus lately on this switch in functional myometrial progesterone receptor isoforms. 
So I switch from the progesterone uh, from the progesterone B uh, isoform to progesterone A, and progesterone receptor A increases and suppresses progesterone receptor B action at term. So latterly, the work of Sam Messiano in particular is focused on this, that there is a functional myometrial progesterone withdrawal due to this PRA, PRB action changing. But my colleague, uh, Dr. Gang Sun, and I have also asked, is there a role for glucocorticoids in human? So if we uh, do some comparative physiology, we'll be drawn to say that, yes, there probably is a role for glucocorticoids. And yet we know that exogenous glucocorticoids, such as dexamethasone or betamethasone, given to cause lung maturation, do not cause delivery. However, paradoxically, uh, we know that glucocorticoids can actually stimulate prostaglandin synthesis in amnion fibroblasts by a stimulation of uh, phospholipase A2 and PGHS2 or cyclooxygenase 2 enzymes. This is in contrast to the majority of cells in the body where glucocorticoids have an anti-inflammatory effect and actually prevent prostaglandin synthesis. But it's been clearly shown that in amnion fibroblasts, glucocorticoids can stimulate prostaglandin synthesis. So we're suggesting that there's a local pathway existing in the amnion at term to stimulate prostaglandin synthesis. And if one goes back uh, to the mid-70s when Liggins was doing most of his work in the sheep showing that glucocorticoids stimulated parturition, there were actual trials of glucocorticoids being used to actually um, induce labor. And several of these studies show that if you looked at women very close to term, glucocorticoids could actually stimulate labor. If you were prior to term, preterm, glucocorticoids, as we know, uh, for example, when given to cause lung maturation, do not stimulate labor. But there was some evidence that at term, they did actually stimulate contractility. So this is a work that's just been recently published by my colleague, Dr. Gang Sun and I, looking at the role of glucocorticoids in human parturition. And what we believe is happening is that there's a local pathway within the fetal membranes whereby cortisol, which is formed by the local action of 11-beta HSD1, which can convert cortisone back to cortisol locally in the fetal membranes, this cortisol will stimulate phospholipase A2 and cyclooxygenase enzymes to stimulate local prostaglandin production. This local prostaglandin production can then stimulate the myometrium to cause contractions. Potentially the reason why exogenous glucocorticoids, such as given to cause lung maturation, don't stimulate labor is that they obviously cross the placenta unmetabolized, but they may cause feedback inhibition on the fetal HPA axis and prevent production of DHES and dampen down estrogen production. And so that estrogen uh, is then not available to cause synthesis of the contraction associated protein. So that's potentially why the exogenous glucocorticoids given for lung maturation don't stimulate labor is because they down regulate the fetal HPA axis. But locally, there may be this mechanism operative in the fetal membranes uh, which replaces the one operative in the placenta in the sheep to stimulate local prostaglandin production. So suggesting glucocorticoids might have a role in labor in the human, but it's very locally within fetal membranes. Okay. I also want to talk about uh, the effect of stress in human pregnancy. So this is um, patterns of CRH, corticotrophin releasing hormone throughout gestation. Uh, we know it increases exponentially throughout gestation. In normal pregnancies, there seems to be a left shift again in preterm pregnancies. And it's been suggested that CRH, which can stimulate myometrial contractility, also has a role in uh, labor. How does that relate to uh, stress? Well, for example, if the mother is stressed, we get activation of the maternal HPA axis, which stimulates maternal cortisol production. If the fetal is stressed, for example, by hypoxia, intrauterine growth restriction, or a preeclamptic pregnancy, this will activate the fetal HPA axis, which will stimulate fetal cortisol production. And cortisol has a positive feedback effect on CRH production in the human placenta. In any other organ, such as the um, 
hypothalamus, cortisol has a negative feedback effect, but at the placental level, cortisol has a positive feedforward effect, so that will stimulate further CRH production and estriol production by the placenta. The CRH may then uh, stimulate myometrial contractility and labor. So this suggests a link between stress and stimulation of labor by the maternal and fetal HPA axes. I just finally want to uh, show you two or three slides uh, talk about other mechanisms that may regulate gene expression in the placenta. So we're all familiar with uh, gene expression uh, causing microRNAs by transcription, the microRNAs, uh, sorry, messenger RNAs are translated into protein, and the proteins can undergo post-translational modifications to have an effect in a tissue. But we now know there are additional levels of regulation, so epigenetic uh, regulation by DNA methylation or histone methylation acetylation can regulate gene expression. Messenger RNA uh, translation can be regulated by microRNAs, uh, which is a short non-coding RNA, and we can then get covalent modifications of these proteins. So there's been a, um, obviously lots of development recently in microRNAs and the role of microRNAs in the placenta. So the mRNAs are small non-coding RNA molecules, about 22 nucleotides, found in plants, animals, and some viruses, and they function in RNA silence in a post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. And they function by a base pairing with complementary sequences within the messenger RNA molecule. We now know there's about 5,000 identify microRNAs, but each microRNA is up to 400 conserved targets. In the placenta, we've shown that microRNA-210, the so-called hypoxemia, regulates trophoblast mitochondrial function, and we know that microRNAs can be released from the placenta as cargo in various sized particles, which range from the large syncytial knots, which I previously described, released from the um, syncytia trophoblast surface down to the very small particles called um, exosomes. And a lot of interest now in analyzing the cargo of exosomes to see what microRNAs they carry. And if you accept that microRNAs can be released from the placenta in exosomes, that means they can be secreted by one cell type, for example, the placenta, and then taken up by another cell type, for example, maternal vascular endothelium, and hence can function, again, as signal transduction molecules. And one example of this is the recent work done by Yoel Sadowski in Pittsburgh, where he's shown that trophoblast exosomes contain the microRNA-19 plus viral properties, and what they've shown is that trophoblast exosomes can confer viral resistance onto, uh, for example, endothelial cells when these exosomes are taken up by the endothelium. And if we then start to consider epigenetically regulated uh, mechanisms, there's a whole range of factors which can epi epigenetically regulate genes such as age, inflammation, gender, genotype, stress, nutrition, metabolism, uh, drugs, and infection. So again, we've got many other uh, regulators which we need to, to consider when we're looking at regulation of gene expression and placental function. So with that, I'd like to uh, draw to a close, and now I think we're at uh, question time, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Myatt. Uh, if you'll just keep that question slide up for us. Um, okay. We've had some questions coming in already, and Dr. Barber is about to ask some. I encourage the audience to continue asking questions through the chat window for this, for this uh, question and answer time. I'll turn things over now to Dr. LaBarbera. Yes, thank you, Dr. Myatt, for an outstanding presentation about this enigmatic organ. Um, I will try to group some of the questions um, by their general topic, but one of the first questions that has come in is, how does the newborn make the transition um, uh, from being uh, controlled to a certain extent by uh, placental hormones to no longer being exposed to placental hormones after parturition. This would seem to be a, uh, a major event for um, going from fetus to newborn that all of a sudden it's free of the environment of all these placental hormones. Well, obviously the uh, exposure to hormones 
particularly the glucocorticoids throughout uh, gestation, particularly late gestation, is preparing those fetal organs for extrauterine life. Uh, so for the you know, dramatic increase in oxygenation, it's going to show, etc. cetera, um, and its nutrient supply is going to be very different. In most cases, obviously, the fetus is prepared for that. So, for example, we know there are hormonal mechanisms involved in the prostaglandins that cause closure of the ductus arteriosus to you know, allow development of circulation through the lungs, etc. cetera. Um, however, if these mechanisms uh, are not operating correctly or are not developed appropriately, then we're going to run into trouble. So, you know, premature closure of the ductus, etc., by inappropriate exposure to these hormones. Um, and for example, the offspring of a gestational diabetic woman, which had been exposed to high levels of glucose in utero, uh, it becomes the fetus becomes hyperinsulinemic. It then is exposed to extrauterine life, and suddenly it's not getting that maternal high levels of maternal glucose but it still retains those high levels of insulin and so becomes hypoglycemic very rapidly. Um, so it's really uh, that the organ systems are maturing uh, in the appropriate regulated fashion in utero to prepare it for extrauterine life, but it, obviously any disruption of that, um, it's ill-prepared and then we run into problems with it. But it definitely means we've got to have that orchestrated sequence of exposure to to hormones throughout gestation to properly m mature and develop the systems to prepare it for extrauterine life. Great, thank you. Here's uh, here are uh, several other questions that are, are related. Um, the question is, how is hormone production in trophoblast cells regulated, or is hormone production in trophoblast cells regulated, and uh, do placental hormones in turn regulate trophoblast cells themselves, and uh, are there hormone receptors uh, for placental hormones in trophoblast cells? So, excellent question. So, the first point is how is hormone production regulated? So, I showed you profiles of angiogenic factors progesterone and CRH throughout gestation. And in quite broad terms, they appear to track and follow very closely syncytiotrophoblast mass. So the more syncytiotrophoblast you have, uh, the greater the amount of peptide and steroid hormone you're producing. So that would suggest they're very loosely regulated. However, you can examine other uh, peptide hormones, for example, PLGF, which shows uh, a very different pattern that doesn't coincide with uh, syncytiotrophoblast mass, so that suggests that may be regulated in a different way. There have been some studies uh, trying to identify, uh, in particular, transcription factors which regulate the different um, hormone productions. For example, uh, Handwerger, um, 10 years or so ago, published several papers examining transcription factors and levels of transcription factors that regulate the production of these steroid hormones. Uh, but I think we still need more investigation to actually what does regulate expression of the, of the hormones. For example, what are the influences of hypoxia, oxidative stress, um, substrate levels on uh, hormone production? And I also showed you that um, in pregnancies with adverse outcomes, there apparently was this left shift in the hormonal profiles. Uh, that to me su suggests that potentially the whole pattern of trophoblast growth and differentiation is left shifted, uh, and that might relate then to conditions which exist uh, either in the uterus at the time of implantation or even prior to implantation that determine the, traje the trajectory of trophoblast growth and differentiation and hence the production of the, uh, the hormones. As to whether the, um, there are steroid receptors, um, those of you who are as old as I am, uh, we'll know that uh, many, many years ago, there was a lot of controversy as to whether the steroid receptors did exist in trophoblast. Indeed, I think they are there, definitely. Um, and so, potentially, the, the um, trophoblast can respond to the steroid hormones. However, the cynic would say, well, the hormone concentrations are way, way above the, the KD of the receptors, so how, how, does, uh, how are they regulated if, if that occurs? And I'm not sure we really know the answer to that. Um, 
is there feedback? There, again, there's probably feedback as well by the hormones back onto trophoblasts, but uh, more work needs to be done in that area, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Now, I have uh, three questions that are all related uh, that have to do with angiogenic factors. Um, and I mean, the first you know, question is whether uh, expression of angiogenic factors in the placenta is, uh, is predetermined genetically or is it affected by metabolic and environmental factors? And this gets to the uh, basis of the other questions as to whether or not um, preeclampsia is the um, result of altered expression of uh, placental angiogenic factors and whether uh, the proangiogenic factors, for example, are the cause or the effect of preeclampsia. So I guess that gets down to what do you think the role of the environment and uh, gene expression and uh, just environmental factors are in regulating angiogenic factors in preeclampsia? Okay, a subject that's dear to my heart, definitely. Um, so first of all, are they, is their expression predetermined genetically? So again, I refer you back to those uh, profiles I showed for the angiogenic factors and which have been published by several different groups now. There appears to be this left shift in uh, production with the adverse pregnancies. If you look at the anti-angiogenic factors, soluble FLIT and soluble endoglin, their production close, production in normal pregnancy closely parallels synesthesia trophoblast mass. So that would suggest that maybe there it's predetermined and it's just the um, pathway that the synesthesia trophoblast growth and development is on which determines angiogenic factor production. It's left shifted in those adverse pregnancy outcomes which suggests if you alter the, the pattern of trophoblast growth and differentiation, you can alter the angiogenic factors. And yet many in vitro observations uh, in cell cultures have shown that um, environmental changes such as hypoxia, uh, nutrient levels, etc., can alter production of the angiogenic factors by uh, trophoblast cells. Um, we obviously have a disconnect between what we're seeing in vivo and in vitro, and nobody's really been able to show, to my knowledge yet, that in vivo we can alter the angiogenic factor production. Uh, particularly in human placenta by uh, external influences, but that's not to say there aren't uh, more subtle effects of things like hypoxia, nutrition, etc., on the angiogenic factor production. The second part of the question was um, are angiogenic factors predictors for preeclampsia, are they cause and effect, etc. There was obviously a great deal of excitement when the angiogenic factors were discovered and differences in preeclampsic pregnancies were first identified. However, I would refer you to the work of uh, Rob Powers from McGee Women's um, in Pittsburgh, who has uh, at least two papers published who show that some women who are uh, defined as preeclamptic show no change in their angiogenic factor profiles throughout uh, gestation. So their angiogenic factors appear completely normal. Uh, that then begs the bigger question of what is preeclampsia uh, and does the, are the angiogenic factors uh, primary causal factors in the development of preeclampsia? Definitely in animal models, alterations in the angiogenic factor production, particularly the anti-angiogenic factors can cause uh, preeclampsia-like uh, syndrome in animal models, um, but whether or not that is the same in humans really, I think, remains to be definitively shown. Um, so that's my answer. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to turn it back over to Jeff. All right, thank you all uh, so much, uh, Dr. Myatt and Dr. LaBarbera. And thank you for attending today's webinar uh, with Dr. Leslie Myatt. This is the third in a series of webinars that the ASRM is presenting in our Grand Round series. Our next webinar is Thursday, November the 5th at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time uh, with Dr. Uh, uh, Raj Sundaram, uh, who will present on how to apply biostatistics 
to clinical problems in reproductive medicine. Look for an email from ASRM with registration details soon. Also, this and all of the ASRM Ground Rounds webinars are posted for rewatching after the initial broadcasts. So visit the ASRM website and look over our Ground Rounds webpage for further information. Uh, also, when we have a new reposting, we do email everyone uh, to notify them that that is uh, now up for, for viewing. So again, uh, thank you to Dr. Myatt. Thank you to everyone. Uh, and this webinar is now ended.